This program contains true stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Whenever possible, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. Sometimes it seems as if it would take nothing short of a miracle to save a life. I'm William Shatner. Tonight, true stories of courage, hope, and compassion on rescue, 911. We begin on December 7th, 1989, near a logging site in the mountains of southern Oregon, as temperatures drop below freezing. It was the dead of winter. Friends since high school, mechanics Ken Murdoch and Ken Leppard had already been on the job for hours that morning. We finished our work up there and decided we'd head for town. It was getting close to Christmas, and it was a really cold, misty day. I mean, the type of cold that no matter how many clothes you wear, it just kind of seeps right through you. We headed down the mountain and come to the gate down there. Lep walked up, opened the gate, and uh, I was sitting in the truck waiting for him to get back in. And I wasn't paying much attention, but he was out there for a few minutes. I was fumbling with the lock, and as I was messing with it, I looked down over the bank there, and I seen this blanket. I kept glancing back at it and thinking, you know, yes, no, yes, no, you know, go, go check it out, forget it. I almost left, and just something just said, no, go look at it. I reached out and seeing the blood and everything, I didn't really know what to expect. But uh, I thought to myself, if I've got to look at this, Ken does too. I walked over the bank and saw the blanket down there. I didn't realize he'd been down and even looked at it. So I just walked down and opened the blanket up, and first thing I saw was a placenta and the umbilical cord all wrapped up there. At that point, I started to get real nervous about opening up the rest of the way. Neither of the Kens were prepared for what was inside when the blanket was fully unwrapped a newborn baby. When I first saw him, he was just all white and blue and didn't look like he was alive. So I jumped back up on the bank trying to hold my stomach down. I ran over and got on the radio and called the office, told them that we needed a state police or the sheriff out there as fast as we could. We found something. I really didn't want to say over the radio what I'd found. I thought he was dead. Police car or sheriff's car appears pretty scared. When we continue. They just like a piece of cold meat out of the refrigerator. Both of us were just so scared that he wasn't going to make it. You could see he just right on the edge. When logging company mechanics Ken Leppard and Ken Murdoch found a newborn baby abandoned by the side of the road, a tiny child was nearly frozen to death. The two men radioed a desperate call for help that was relayed immediately to 911. This is Sharon at Cascade Timber Company. Mm -hmm. I have a, a mechanic and some people up by the, the burn that was up at the lake. He just called in and he said to please 
huge hurry with a sheriff or a state policeman up to that gate that goes in. He's very shook up. He said they have found something. Okay. And he sounds extremely agitated, and I've never heard him that way before. And Lep told me he thought he heard something. He thought the baby was alive, so I ran back down the bank and checked him, and he moved one eyelid just a little bit, I think. He's alive, Lep. But he's just like a piece of cold meat out of the refrigerator. The blanket was soaking wet that he was wrapped in. He was froze stiff, and heck, I didn't know what to do. We were scared to death he was going to die on us. Are you still there, Sherry? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, Jesus, okay, we will do. He said someone has dumped a baby out there. It's still alive. They need an ambulance. He said if they're going to wrap it up if you want to meet him somewhere along the line. He said that baby's not going to make it much longer. They need an ambulance. Okay, we'll get somebody out there, okay? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Emergency units were immediately dispatched. With each passing second, the baby's life was slipping away. You could see he was really close to dying. First thought was to get him warm, so I stripped my coveralls off, took my sweatshirt off, and slid it underneath him so it'd be halfway dry. I'll get him in the truck. We both looked at each other and said, let's not wait. You know, we can't wait. He's too close. So we just finally just picked him up and set him in the front seat of the truck, and rolled the windows up and turned the heater up all the way and uh, on one hand telling each other, you know, well, he's going to be all right. And Ken kept telling him, you know, you're, you're going to be okay, little guy, you know. And uh, then in the back of our minds thinking, uh, he's too far gone. They headed for the hospital. Both of us were just so scared that he wasn't going to make it. You could see he just right on the edge. So I just kept talking to him. You're all right. Yeah. Sheriff's deputy, Tom Johnson, went to the scene. It really hit home hard. Because here's a brand new baby. It appears the woman that had the baby possibly had the baby right there and then just wrapped it up and just discarded it. Saw like so much baggage. I saw this pickup truck flashing its headlights up and down. It's a newborn. He's not going to make it very long. The baby's color was, he almost looked blue-gray. It almost didn't even look like he was alive. This is 31. Of course, you have an ambulance response code 3. This is a brand new baby. Ken just gathered the baby up and went around to the back of the ambulance, and they met him there. And they had to chase him out of the back of the ambulance. He was going to go with him. You form a bond real quick with a baby like that. I mean, you sit there and hold on to him so tight. You just, I didn't want to put him down. It was a funny feeling, you know, like, you just feel like he's yours. You know? Not something you want to just walk away and leave. Something you want to take home with you and hold him tight. Paramedic Brian Gronke examined the newborn baby. The baby was just white and was so cold. We have hypothermic thermometers which go down to 84 degrees and they wouldn't even read on air. You couldn't get any pulses as far as like on his neck or on his arm or anything like that. I, I really didn't think he had a lot of chances. 12 miles away at the Merle West Medical Center, an ER team was mobilized, including pediatric nurse Barb Bjorki. We did not assume it was going to be a baby that was frozen was rigid um, on death's door. When you laid him down in the ER, hooked him back up to the heart monitor, and his heart had stopped at that point. And I think that was probably the most scary part is when I first laid him down, I was like, it's over. You know, we, we you know, we've lost him. I couldn't even get a jar open. He's just too cold. I don't hear anything. Let's go ahead and bag him. See if we can get him in the bed. Yeah, go ahead. Dr. Trainer was next to me. We were suctioning the mouth. And she said, open the mouth. And I said, I'm trying. The baby was so cold. The jaw was rigid. Um, could barely get it to open. 
pediatrician Dr. Charles Labui was also called into the emergency room. When I first got the call uh, and was leaving the office, I told my office staff that I didn't think it would be very long before I would be back because I, it didn't sound like this baby was salvageable. I thought the dear Lord would determine whether this baby was going to survive or not, and I just do my part. At the scene where the two Kens found the baby, sheriff's investigators looked for clues to help them find his mother. His rate's picking up a little bit. By 3 o'clock in the afternoon, two hours after he had been here, the baby's temperature had made it to 94 degrees. He was trying to cry and just improved constantly. It was just truly a miracle. Within a few hours, the baby was doing well enough to be transferred to the nursery and given a name, Benjamin Kenneth Forrest. I left at about 3.30 and turned Benjamin's care over to the nurse on the next shift. And at that point, I looked down, I said, you're gonna make it, Ben. I just know that you are. I called the hospital, asked him if he was gonna keep all his fingers and toes and everything, because he was awfully cold. And they said, uh, is this one of the cans? And I said, yeah. They said, well, you can come and see this baby 24 hours a day if you want to. They said, we consider you guys family. Of course, we got instantly attached to him. We both just fell in love with him. And it, the fact that we'd saved his life hadn't even really hit me yet. I think it was about the third night when we were up at the hospital and some women that had been up there several times visiting the baby watched him through the windows. She walked up, they asked me if I was one of the heroes. And <laughs> I just felt like climbing under the nearest table. You know, just, that's not me. I'm, you know, it's, you just do what you have to do and you don't uh, think of it in that text. It was a Christmas story kind of situation. We were preparing for Christmas, and here this baby from nowhere was brought into us. You could just feel the unifying force surrounding Benjamin. In the true spirit of Christmas, the baby who had no family and nowhere to live received hundreds of offers from people who wanted to help. After two weeks in the hospital, baby Benjamin was adopted. Christmas had a lot to do with it. As a matter of fact, when we were out being interviewed, they kept trying to put some religious ties to it. You know, do you think God had anything to do with this and everything? And Ken and I both kind of looked at each other and then uh, he said, uh, no, but he said, it does make you believe in Santa Claus. I thought that was really cute. He's not cute, but that was cute. <laughs> Wishing for that Ferrari. <laughs> Baby Benjamin might never know the two Kens who saved his life, but the memory of him and the events of that cold December day will be with them forever. Recently, I had a birthday, and we were talking about little Benjamin that day and hoping that he has a lot of happy birthdays in the future. I'm sure he will. Next. There's always the possibility that there's uh, a disturbance still going on, whether you hear anything inside or not. Bridgecrest Police Department! Not every community has enhanced 911, which automatically displays the exact address of the caller. Rescuers learn just how valuable that can be when a life is at stake and those in trouble can't tell dispatchers where they're calling from. It was around 10.58 p.m. on July 19, 1990. 911 dispatcher Amy Weidenkopf was nearing the end of her shift at the police department in Ridgecrest, California, when a call for help came in. Services. 
All I could hear was a dog barking, and I thought I heard a woman whimpering, and then I got disconnected real shortly after that. As soon as I started dialing back, the 911 rang again, and I picked it back up. Emergency services. It was the same address, and at that point, I knew something was going on. Police officer Randy Bias was sent to the scene. On the 911 calls of that nature where you have uh, one or two hang-ups and then an open line, you have either a disturbance or a medical emergency. Officer Bias arrived within three minutes. I like to get a visual on the house before I actually uh, stop, so I drove past the house. It was all dark inside. Uh, most of the blinds on the front of the house were closed, and the front porch light wasn't on. There's always a possibility that there's uh, a disturbance still going on, whether you hear anything inside or not, or if there was um, a female there by herself, and it was possibly a burglar that had gotten into the house. She was able to call 911, and then she hid without talking on the phone. I went ahead and went to check the windows and to see if I could see anybody inside. A second officer, Rick DeMarco, who was already in the area, also responded to the call. The dispatcher was telling us that she could still hear the heavy breathing and the phone being moved. So you're always thinking that somebody's in there still trying to get to the phone to call for help. After I came back around front and I checked with the neighbors, Officer DeMarco arrived. Got no noise inside whatsoever. I told him what I had found and what I believe could be possibly going on inside and asked if he'd go around back with me and check the windows and doors once again and to look in to see if he could see anything that I had possibly missed. And as we came around the back side of the house, the curtains for the master bedroom were open. And we noticed that the bedding for the master bed was messed up, and also that the master bathroom light was still on. So we figured somebody had been sleeping, and they're feeling ill, went to the bathroom, and maybe had a heart attack or something like that. The officers were not allowed to enter the house without approval from their commanding officer, Sergeant Al Mitchell. When you're responding to a call like that, you always want to get there as soon as you can in case there is a medical emergency that requires that you handle it in a timely fashion. It sounds like right now somebody's messing with the phone, but I'm not giving you the answer. Hello? What do you guys got? I think it's a medical emergency. The dispatcher was telling us that she could still hear like a breathing, a heavy breathing, and the phone being moved. All the windows, they're all locked. This doesn't seem to be the easiest one out of all. It's not as secure as the other ones. 1268, still have an open line. Yeah, let's go through that. No, affirmative. I can hear some sort of light movement going around the phone, but the dog is completely quiet. That was really barking a little bit ago. I can hear you ringing the doorbell with all the racket that was going on, because I could hear them beating on the doors and everything, trying to get somebody's attention, and all of a sudden the dog's quiet. That made me nervous, because I thought somebody's in the house. 
you know, that doesn't belong there. Yeah, let's go through that door. While I was trying to break down the door, there was always a sense that, you know, maybe it still is a setup. So you don't want to just break through the doors and fall inside because you'll be, you'll be vulnerable to anybody who's standing there. You feel somewhat safe when you're outside, but once you kick the door open, you have to follow through. Department, is there anybody in the house? Uh, they're opening it themselves. Oh. I was really scared for them. And I sort of panicked because I thought, I hope somebody gets on the air soon. Are you there? Can we check any place that someone could be hiding? Bedrooms, bathrooms, closets. All the cushions were turned up on the couch. I made an assumption at that time, I guess, that the people were probably out of town. The house is clear. Okay, great. Hey, Randy. What do we got here? Got the phone cord wrapped around him. <laughs> I guess he dialed 911. Hi, Amy. Hi. I got untangled. His dog is going to choke to death. Are you serious? Is that dog. why you shut up? He's just, he's just about to choke to death. I got to get him out of the cord. I'm going to unplug the phone. Okay. Bye. When he told me what it was, you could tell he was laughing, and they thought it was really funny. And the fact that the dog had dialed 911 just made it even funnier. I wish I had a dog that smart. It's a good boy. We were unable to get the phone cord untangled in his hair and off his neck, so we had to cut the phone cord. Take a look at him. I think she's okay. Anywhere else? The dog oh. uh, didn't even have any serious marks on it, a little redness. I don't see anything. It was tight, though. This is the first time in my 17 years that I've ever encountered an animal or a dog having done the uh, 911 dialing himself. He probably walk next to the phone cord, pulled the phone off the counter, and in the struggle to get away, he wrapped the phone cord around his neck. So we're down looking at this dog, and we're trying to figure out how this dog dialed 911. And then we realized the phone had to be an automatic emergency dial, or the dog must have stepped on it. Maybe back to the 27th. back to the 27th, yeah. Well... We have to leave them a note because when they get home and see the door smashed, the phone cord cut. I gave uh, Sergeant Mitchell one of my cards, and then he wrote a note to the residents stating why we broke in their front door and the circumstances leading up to it and what we found and why their phone cord was cut. Dear sir, <laughs> sorry about your doors, but guaranteed your house was secured. We had our sergeant stand in front of your doors. <laughs> you see, he could actually sign it by printing your name because he's leaving your card, so... Oh, that's right, he's leaving my card. Wait a minute. <laughs> we made sure the front door was locked so nobody else could get through since we did have to break it in. And then uh, walked out through the garage and made it secure, and that was it. Nine days later, Art Escobar and his family returned from their vacation to find that Buffy, their 15-year-old Lhasa Apso, had suffered no ill effects from her ordeal. This dog is really, really pampered. She's well fed, well taken care of. She is part of the family. She's losing her sight, losing her hearing, and uh, sometimes she tends to run into walls. But uh, we thought we had taken all precautions to take care of her when we had someone coming over and checking the house and checking her and feeding her. Decisions, you can't make a decision, can you? 
Even though they had to repair their front door, the Escobars are grateful to 911 and the Ridgecrest police officers who answered Buffy's desperate call for help. If they hadn't come in and rescued my dog, I would think that my dog would have choked to death. I think she's got her own little guardian angel watching over her. Any phone call to make, Buffy? <laughs> Next. I was able to pull the maxi brake. It had slowed the truck down dramatically, but we we're still going towards the tree. Perhaps because their lives depend on one another, emergency workers share a special bond. For the members of the new Canaan Fire Department, John DePanny was more than just a respected co-worker. He was also a dear friend. You work together, you fight fires together, so you have like a bonding, a strong relationship with everybody in the firehouse. And it's like one of your fallen comrades in a sense. I grew up around the fire department. My dad was chief for about six years. That's how I really know John and my dad. I love him. I love him like a brother or father, really. But he's like a father to a lot of people here, I think. When I used to come up here as a kid, I'd talk to him when he was working here, as I did the other firemen engineers. You know, just known each other for a long time. John had been a New Canaan fireman for 30 years. Everyone in the department knew and respected him. John was a close family friend, down-to-earth guy. He's there for you if you needed him. His cheerfulness around the firehouse, you know, made you feel, you know, like you belonged here. At approximately 5.10 p.m. on May 21st, 1990, a call came in reporting a kitchen fire. Both full-time and volunteer firefighters were immediately dispatched. The volunteers are dispatched through a paging network. Everybody carries a pager with them. They respond from their homes or from their jobs or social activities to the call of emergency. Fifty-eight-year-old John DePanny was driving the engine on that day. Mike, what's our water supply going to be up there? We went out to the call. Everything was fine. We got through some pretty bad corners on North Mountain Road. He's driving along, and he took his foot off the accelerator. I thought he was going to turn down the wrong road. He reached over and grabbed his chest and fell over. I was able to pull the maxi brake. It had slowed the truck down dramatically, but we were still going towards the tree. I couldn't figure out what was going on. First thing that went through my mind was something was wrong with the truck. Johnny's down. Johnny's down. You hear that down. clear as day. Those three words, John is down. I think I'll remember those words till the day I die, probably. Just, just the way he said it, and then see him waving at me. I knew, I just knew, it wasn't good. It was like everything was just going so, so slow. It just was real, real weird. It's almost like a dream. I called on the radio, advised them that he was having a heart attack. I don't believe he's breathing. Tell the ambulance they're going to have to move. I wasn't sure if it was a heart attack at that time or not. I didn't panic. Paul Carl came over to assist. I just kept talking to him, telling him, you know, John, everything's going to be fine. And while I'm talking on the radio, I reached out my door and said, is he breathing? And Joe said, I believe he's breathing. I looked down, I see Mr. DePanny laying there with two firefighters. And at that point, I said, wow, you know, what's going on? Ron DeMario was an EMT. So I noticed the diagonal breathing right away. I knew that he wasn't breathing. It sounds like he's inhaling, but all he's doing is just exhaling all the air that's left in his lungs. I was upset, you know, I, I, was, I was, part of me died right there on the, on, on the scene. 
it's like your own brother. You know, that's the fireman thing. It's like they're all brothers, and we all stick together type thing. I call full cardiac and start a CPR. It's really scary. I've done it before on people. Now it's somebody that you know, somebody that you're close with. It's a lot harder. I don't really know how to explain what I felt. I saw a friend that was dead. Assistant Fire Chief Jack Van Dusen had known John all his life. We saw Johnny lying on the ground. His ears were blue. His throat was blue. We had to try and do what we had to do to get him back. Oh, I've known John all my life. I just couldn't believe it. There was a thousand things going through my mind. And one of them was, oh my God, you know, this is the way my father died. Why does it have to happen to me, you know, that, you know, I have to be here going through this? You know, it, it just brought back a lot of memories, you know, of my father and what, you know, we went through the night that he passed away. And it was like reliving that night being with Johnny on the side of the road. As I'm looking down at John, I'm saying to John, everything's going to be fine. You're going to be fine. I look over at Fred, and he's crying. And I just looked back at John, and I, you know, I, didn't, I, I didn't give up. You know, I, I still thought my mind, everything was going to be fine, um, that he was going to come out of it. And that's all I kept you know, in, my, in my mind. So it was uh, pretty emotional. Margaret Donaldson, who is an EMT with the ambulance corps, arrived with her oxygen unit by using the oxygen, what I was, you know, hoping is to make sure that there was no damage going to be done to the brain. The closest ambulance had only basic life support equipment, so an advanced life support unit was sent from Norwalk Hospital, but it was 10 minutes away. Firefighters continued on to the scene. You're hoping and praying that things are going to work out. And you just don't stop. You keep going. Breathe, Johnny, breathe! Come on, Johnny, hang in there. Al, I want the defibrillator now! The first piece of equipment to arrive next to me was the defibrillator. I knew CPR was doing its job, but I needed to try to, if you will, jumpstart Johnny's heart by sending an electrical current through his heart. Okay, stop CPR, please. John was lying there. His eyes were still wide open. When he shocked him, I never saw <clears throat> the effect of what happens. And your body actually jumps off the ground, so to speak. And uh, that was a tough thing to see because I never saw that before. Hot damn, we got a pulse. Do it, John, do it. Our main goal now, let's get him packaged on the backboard in the ambulance and let's boogie. You know, everybody had tears. There was a lot of tears. Once we were inside the ambulance, the defibrillator, it analyzes and constantly monitors the heart. Looked at the monitor, I checked for a pulse. Pulse was gone. He's back in V5, our CPR. I knew that at that point we were again losing Johnny. I felt like, you know, why? I, I just couldn't believe, you know, we had him and now we lost him again. Pressing the shot. Come on, Johnny. Come on, Johnny. Damn, no pulse. Pressing the analyze. Slow beat fifth. Stand back. Come on, Johnny. Come on, Johnny. Nothing. 
Once the third shock was administered, our last option was get him to the paramedic intercept. I mean, I cried for nice an hour, an hour straight. I just cried and cried and cried. And I, I mean, I thought he's gonna die. Somebody I'd known, and he died right in front of me. I figured. The first ambulance met the advanced life support unit halfway to the hospital, where paramedics took over John's care. Both of us pulled over to the side of the road simultaneously. It made it more difficult to know that the other rescuers who were there knew him personally. And it put a bigger burden, I think, on all the paramedics who were there and the EMTs. We looked at the monitor, and it showed V-fib, or ventricular fibrillation, which is a heart that, in essence, has stopped and is not perfusing. When we saw him in ventricular fibrillation, we knew that he needed to be shocked right away. Two for pulse, flatline. Okay, I got nothing here. Come on, Johnny, come on. CPR again. I was ecstatic, I, you know, a big sigh of relief. And I'm saying, come on, Johnny, you can do it, you know, you can do it. It takes a long time after someone has resuscitated before they really are out of the woods, and he was far from out of the woods. On the way down, you could tell Johnny was reacting better. You could feel him, he was squeezing your hand. You know, there was just like, my God, you know, he definitely got a chance. When John arrived at the hospital, he was still unconscious. No one knew how serious his heart attack would turn out to be. At that point, we knew that he would be alive for a couple hours at least, but we didn't know if he was going to go on after that and how much damage was done to the heart because it had stopped or muscle damage, tissue damage. When I left, I knew Johnny was going to at least pull through. How long, I didn't know. I, uh, I left the hospital feeling that he's in the best hands and that he will pull through. And here we are, you know, he pulled through. Within a month, John DePani had recovered from his sudden death heart attack. He's still on disability and plans to retire. In October, he and Linda Kennedy were married. It took a little while to sink in what happened, but uh, as every day goes, I uh, realize uh, really how fortunate and lucky I was. A woman told me one time that when you wake up in the morning, you should be happy that you're alive. And so many people just wake up and they just go to their jobs every day and they don't think about, this could be my last day, you know? I think John thinks that now, too. So you talk about Jack and you talk about Mike. I knew them when they were little boys. If they didn't know what they were doing, I wouldn't be here today. I think we're all closer. We all shared in this moment of uh, saving a life. It was so fragile. It was so fragile. One second you're here, one second you're gone. The whole CPR thing and, you know, working together, and everybody just clicking right in, I think saved his life. I don't like it. Hey, Jack. Hey, how you doing, buddy? Yeah, not just bad. knowing that I was a part of it, and I helped. I did what I could do. Just, it was a wonderful feeling. When the 12 o'clock noon whistle goes I mean, off, just seeing him walking around and enjoying what I call a second life. I mean, that means everything in the world to me. He was there when I needed him, when I was 13, and my father died. It just so happened that in return, I was there for him. Next. I realized Jamie was choking, he was making no sound. I was so scared. I panicked, and I didn't know what to do. On December 13, 1988, 29-year-old Robin Klaus was driving with her two young children near their home in Phoenix, Arizona. 
But before the evening was over, the magic of Christmas would take on a new meaning for them. It was a couple of weeks before Christmas, and we'd been Christmas shopping, and we was on our way to the mall to see Santa, and they was really happy about this. But five-year-old Stephanie and four-year-old Jamie were also getting hungry. We went to a drive through I do have a rule that we don't eat in the car, but the kids were so excited about seeing Santa, I let them. So we was on our way to the mall, and on the way, we stopped at the stoplight, and all of a sudden, I saw this toaster end up on the floor. I was really upset. I thought he just threw it down. But I realized Jamie was choking. He wasn't making no sound. He was gasping for air. and had tears in his eyes. When he was choking, it looked like he was holding his neck and went up, uh, up, uh, up. Uh. So I reached over Steffi hitting him on the back, trying to get the food dislodged. And it just wasn't working. I was so scared. I panicked, and I didn't know what to do. And then the van next to me, the man asked me if Is there was a problem? problem. Yeah, my son's choking. And I grabbed Jamie out and took him upside down, hitting him on the back. Give him to me. And this guy, he grabbed Jamie and pushed his stomach in. It turned out to be Santa. He dislodged the food, and Jamie started crying. I realized Jamie was OK when he started crying and making sounds. I had tears in my eyes, and I, I could even hardly get the word thank you out. And he just got in his van and drove away. And we just drove off in our separate ways. And I was so shaken up. I didn't realize the man was Santa until my daughter asked me why Santa was driving the van. She said, why was Santa in the van going where? <laughs> and I said, he's going to the North Pole to get his reindeer. We didn't get to thank Santa or anything. He got in the car and left. And we turned around and went home. I really wanted to thank him. So the next day, I called the newspaper and asked him how I would go about putting an ad in the newspaper to locate a Santa Claus that helped my little boy out. Stories about the mystery Santa were picked up by the local media including radio station KNIX. Just then, a stranger dressed as the jolly old man himself jumps out of a van, performs the Heimlich maneuver, clearing Jamie's throat and allowing the boy to breathe. Then Santa hops back into his sleigh, a rather van, and drives off. His name? Who knows? Well, I'd like to know. It's now 7.56. Gail Long was well acquainted with the Santa they were looking for. I've known him for between 15 and 20 years. We're good friends. And knowing him like I do, I knew that he would never tell anyone else because he is a type of a man that does not like to blow his own horn. So I called the radio station and told them who he was. Word spread quickly. One week before Christmas, a special visitor came to see Jamie's family. Merry Christmas! Jamie's a pretty shy little guy. I had to almost pull him out behind the door. Hi, buddy. Come here, let me see you. Come on. You remember seeing me the other night? Jamie thought it was really something because Santa Claus made a special trip here to the house for him. I said thank you because he saved my brother's life. I'm very grateful to him for being there. If it wasn't for him, I probably would have Jamie to this day. Here. Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas, everybody! Merry that year, the spirit of Christmas touched the Klaus family in a very special way. Oh, look what old Santa has for you kids. Jamie's one with the green. Stephanie gets one with the green. He's a very warm and cheery guy. It seems like he loves the children. 
Do you like Christmas time? Yes. I had yeah. Jamie go buy him a gift because I, I, Santa never gets gifts. <laughs> I thought, well, for a change, Santa should have a gift this time. Is this for me? Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Jamie's a little more open now with Santa Claus. I've got a collection of coffee mugs at home. Santa saved me. I never thought I was going to meet Santa like that. Jamie still goes around telling a lot of people that Santa Claus did save his life. What grade are you in? It makes me think that I have done something, you know, for humanity. Who knows, who, who knows what Jamie may grow up to be? And because I was there, maybe he's had that chance to grow up to be something. There's no gift more precious than life. We owe it to one another to learn CPR and basic life-saving techniques. This series is dedicated to all the men and women who answer our calls for help and are there when we need them most. I'm William Shatner. Join us again next week for more true stories on Rescue 911.